Hey everyone, I'm uh, Nick Larichelle. I'm an emergency medicine physician at Concord Hospital. I grew up in New England and uh, went to medical school at the University of Mont Vermont and uh, residency at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania and returned to Concord Hospital uh, almost six years ago. Um, so I practice in the emergency department and I'm going to talk to you today about um, some updates in acute stroke care. Um, I'm the medical director in the emergency department in our transfer center and, and also as part of my draw job as our uh, medical director of our stroke program. So I'm not a stroke neurologist, but we, we uh, deal with acute stroke a lot in the emergency department, and so I hope to provide some interesting updates to acute stroke care for you today. So on the slide here, um, we're gonna, a little a bit more about what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, so we're gonna talk about uh, stroke diagnosis and pathophysiology, uh, some updates uh, in acute stroke treatment, and that'll be the main uh, part of the talk today. Um, we'll cover our stroke program at Concord Hospital uh, and our new partnership we have with a telestroke vendor and then uh, what I see as kind of the future of a stroke care uh, in the acute setting. Uh, this uh, over here is Jen Pletcher. Uh, she's a nurse in our emergency department and uh, the stroke program manager and I work very closely with her on uh, any changes uh, we make to our stroke program. So why do we care about uh, stroke? Uh, stroke is the leading cause of disability uh, worldwide. Uh, it's a time-critical diagnosis, so if we recognize a stroke early, it allows us to uh, manage uh, the stroke differently, and it helps to optimize uh, patient outcomes in the end. New evidence over the last five to ten years has significantly changed how we approach uh, particularly acute uh, stroke care. So our goal in acute stroke care is to mitigate long-term stroke-related disability and mortality. So if we see patients early on when they're experiencing symptoms, that opens up options for uh, treatment that may change their functional status at three months, at a year, at five years. Definition of stroke is an abrupt onset of neurological symptoms uh, due to an interruption in blood flow to the brain. So this is a vascular process where we have either an occlusion in a blood vessel or disruption to the wall of the blood vessel that leads to uh, neurologic symptoms in the brain. Clinically, we think of strokes as progressive strokes that are evolving over time. So those are patients who have symptoms that are developing, that are changing. Uh, strokes that are completed, where there's an area of the brain that is impacted long term. Um, and then uh, transient ischemic attack, also known as a TIA, or what we call also a, a mini stroke. Um, our old definition was uh, when there is a neurologic change in recovery within uh, 24 hours. So there's a small area of the brain that is without adequate blood supply but recovers. Our new definition is based on what happens to that tissue in the brain. And we've been able to change that definition because of the greater availability of imaging to determine the impact of, uh, on the brain. And the new definition is a, uh, that of a transient neurologic dysfunction uh, due to a focal ischemia or area of the brain that was with less blood flow without infarction, so without a long-term long tissue death to that area of the brain. We're going to talk mostly about uh, the uh, progressing and evolving stroke today, which opens us up to uh, treatment in the acute period. Um, and then we'll cover a little bit um, the uh, other two uh, clinical strokes that we, that we uh, deal with, which are strokes that have completed or TIAs. And our focus in that aspect is really, about, is really on determining why the stroke occurred and then preventing further uh, uh, stroke in the future. There are many modifiable risk factors for stroke. So um, similar uh, risk factors that we have for cardiovascular disease, um, high cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, um, so things that we can work on that we hear about in our uh, primary care physician's office. And then there are also uh, fixed risk factors. So age um, is, a, is a risk factor. Uh, having a prior stroke, you're at risk for an additional stroke in the future. Uh, genetics certainly play a, a very strong role, uh, and then gender as well. So we're going to talk about mainly about uh, ischemic strokes today. So there are two types of stroke. One is, one is an ischemic stroke, and that's 85% of the strokes that we see. And then a hemorrhagic stroke, which is about 15% of the strokes that we see. Um, and during an ischemic stroke, there's a disruption in blood flow to the brain. So there's a blockage or obstruction in an artery. And during, in, in a hemorrhagic stroke, there's a disruption of the wall of the blood vessel and blood leaks out of that blood vessel into the brain. So we'll talk mainly about the ischemic com uh, component, and there are two types there, thrombotic and embolic strokes. We'll look at closer in a minute. 
and then two types of hemorrhages that we see in the brain that we'll talk about as well. So the pathophysiology of stroke, the, the brain needs oxygen and glucose. <clears throat> 15% of the blood that leaves the left side of the heart uh, goes to the brain, yet 20% of the oxygen that is consumed by the body is consumed in the brain. So the brain is a high, uh, highly metabolic or organ, consumes a lot of oxygen. So you can imagine if we leave the brain without blood flow uh, to an area, <clears throat> that we have a short period of time to restore blood flow to save that tissue. Uh, cerebral blood flow is also autoregulated, and it's really a, a highly aerobic, it really is an aerobic uh, solely metabolizer. When we have disruption in blood flow to the brain, we don't have adequate oxygen delivery, we don't have adequate glucose delivery, there's production of free radicals and a lot of inflammatory cells that lead to uh, damage to that uh, brain tissue. There is an ability over time to recover some of that tissue, but oftentimes there's a core area that is impacted long term that we cannot recover. So first to look at uh, ischemic stroke. So there's two types we mentioned, an, an embolic stroke, and that occurs when there's a blood clot in a, blo in a, a vessel that travels to the brain. So for example, a blood clot can form in the heart and become dislodged and travel to the brain. We can also have a, a thrombosis in an artery, so we, a plaque that develops over time. Um, due to chronic narrowing in the blood vessel, and that can restrict blood flow long term to an area of the brain. Looking a little bit closer at the embolic component, one condition we worry about in acute stroke and, and long term in preventing stroke is a heart arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. And this is the most common heart arrhythmia we, we deal with, particularly in the emergency department. And during, with that heart arrhythmia, there's uh, an abnormal conduction of electricity uh, in the heart. Um, and a blood clot can form and travel uh, to the brain, particularly in the top left part of the heart. Um, also, when patients have a heart attack, they might form a blood clot in the heart that can travel to the brain if their left heart is not functioning as well. And then uh, in other conditions, there can be uh, clots that form on, uh, on the heart valve that could travel to the brain. And our goal, particularly when we are de uh, dealing with atrial fibrillation, is uh, to, pre to prevent uh, that clot from uh, going to the brain. So sometimes we do place patients on blood thinners or we perform a procedure to, to prevent that, which we'll talk about in a minute. You can also have embolization from one artery to another. So we could have a plaque that forms, particularly at uh, where an artery splits, and a clot could attach there and then eventually dislodge uh, and go to a smaller artery in the brain and cause a stroke. So this is an example of a, this is an MRI. So in the MRI, the top of the brain is up here and the back of the brain is up, is down here. And we're looking up through the brain here. <clears throat> this is an area of uh, abnormal diffusion in the brain on uh, MRI. So, and this is an example of a lacunar stroke where someone may have a long-term occlusion, a small vessel in the brain, and that uh, area is impacted during the stroke. And this is one slide about hemorrhagic stroke. So that's the, uh, we have ischemic stroke, 85%, hemorrhagic stroke, 15%. Um, so this is the other type of stroke uh, that we see. And that really has to do with disruption of the wall of the blood vessel in the brain. And blood leaks out of that blood vessel and enters the brain tissue. Um, outside of the vessel, there's structural disruption to the neurons. So there's tracts of white matter neurons in the brain that are disrupted and the neurons can't, aren't able to talk to each other as well. That can occur, uh, this is a, an example of a CAT scan. Uh, during, uh, in this patient has experienced an intracranial hemorrhage. Though on CAT scan, uh, blood shows up as white in the acute period, so right after uh, uh, the bleed occurs. It, this can occur due to chronic hypertension, which impacts the wall of the blood vessel, and eventually that wall can become disrupt, disrupted and rupture. This is an example of a different type of bleed called a subarachnoid hemorrhage in which there's um, an aneurysm in the brain and over time there's pressure on that aneurysm and that aneurysm can rupture and the blood enters the subarachnoid space. Um, this can also occur, occur if there's a, an abnormality uh, be, uh, or an abnormal link between an artery and a vein which can rupture if there's high pressure in that area. Often patients with this, uh, with this type of bleed present with a very severe headache that starts really suddenly. So signs and symptoms of stroke. Uh, there are a lot of different signs and symptoms of stroke. When we uh, think about the most, the most common symptoms we think about are 
uh, if someone has a facial droop, if someone has arm weakness or leg weakness, those are more, if we're interacting with someone, those are more obvious. And if we're, if we're walking, if we're doing something, those are more obvious to us as well. But you can see um, the brain is extremely complex and there are uh, areas of the brain that control other functions uh, besides just those voluntary uh, movements. So the back of the brain controls some of our vision, uh, the cerebellum uh, controls uh, posture, balance, and the coordination of movement. Um, in the frontal lobe, uh, there's, uh, the brain functions uh, in concentration, thinking, behavior, personality. So there are subtle changes you can imagine that may be more difficult to pick up if someone is having a stroke. And when someone presents with uh, stroke-like symptoms, when we're thinking about what area of the brain could be impacted, based on the slide we were just showing, and then we're thinking back to the, our, the blood flow to that area of the brain. So there's an, the anterior circulation in the brain, which supplies most of the blood to the brain, and then there's a posterior circulation as well. So we're, we're thinking about what, uh, what blood vessel could have been disrupt disrupted. So where was the blood flow disruption? And what might we be able to offer the patient for treatment? Because the location can impact um, what treatment we can offer. There is an area of the brain called the circle of Willis where there's a communication between the two uh, blood, flow, uh, blood supplies to the brain. So if you had a stroke in the front of the brain in the anterior circulation, um, you might get some, depending on how good that uh, blood flow is, that collateral flow from the back of the brain, you might get some collateral flow to that area that is without blood from the, from the anterior circulation. This is a scale we use uh, in the EMS world uh, that we post in the community to help recognize stroke symptoms. And when you look at the symptoms listed here, the ones we've traditionally thought about, facial droop, arm weakness, leg weakness, speech change, um, those are more obvious to us. And to this diagram we've added, in scale, we've added uh, the B and the E. And those stand for balance in eyes. So this helps us to identify that stroke that we don't think of as commonly, where someone may have a, a change in balance, uh, a headache, headache or dizziness, and then they might have a change in vision. And particularly, that helps us to identify strokes that might occur in the back of the brain, uh, where we can offer treatment for those as well. All right, and you saw the EMS photo. We work closely with our EMS teams on, on stroke education. We have protocols um, at the state level and local level for, for how we activate a stroke uh, pre-hospital and notify the hospital to prepare for that. So over in uh, about 10 years ago, there was a target stroke initiative uh, by the American Heart Association with a focus on uh, three uh, big things. One, pre-hospital stroke notification. So we found that patients get quicker uh, care and better care when they come to the hospital by ambulance because we have things that we do in the pr prior to their arrival that activate our stroke team and prepare for their arrival. Second component uh, is the activation of the stroke team. And on our stroke team, we have, we have a clinician, we have uh, nursing staff, technicians, laboratory, radiology, pharm uh, pharmacy, uh, and those are all just on our acute stroke team. So all those members are available to meet the patient on arrival. And then the third component is rapidly obtaining brain imaging inter and interpretation. And that helps to guide our treatment. And really what that tells us is, with that initial CAT scan, is a patient having a hemorrhagic stroke or not, and what treatment might they be uh, um, able to receive acutely. So the, the title of this talk is Time is Brain. This is kind of an evolving phenomenon, and, and over the, in the next uh, couple of minutes, we'll talk more about how this is gonna evolve over time, and we may, not see, um, we may not see stroke as time is brain as much in the future, and we might have a better understanding of, uh, from a tissue standpoint of what tissue might be salvageable, and it, where our treatments might not be just based on when someone presents after onset of their symptoms. So I'm going to show you a, a, a video of um, a stroke activation in our emergency department that we made recently. It shows kind of a collaboration that we have with our uh, telestroke uh, service as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that video uh, afterwards. Conger Hospital, Conger Hospital, Stewart's 124, stroke alert. This is Conger, go ahead. We're in Mountaineer facility, 37, 37-year-old female patient, conscious alert. She's had a uh, family party, and she has sudden onset of altered mental status confusion, and also to be noted as an unsteady balance while walking. She's got no 
prior history of stroke in the past. They also did note that she has some expressive aphasia. Uh, based on our assessment, we're definitely noticing uh, some right-sided weakness, uh, unequal grips, slight facial droop. Last known well time was approximately 2.30 this afternoon. Uh, current blood pressure is 160 over 82. Her heart rate's 102. Respirations are 20 sats or 100% on room air. She's got a blood sugar of 109. That's 109 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, we've got two IVs established, 18 gauges in both KCs. Uh, at this point, she's got a history of aortic stenosis as well. No medications that we know of and no known drug allergies. Our ETA is approximately three to five minutes. We'll give you the rest on the Any questions? Nothing further. You'll proceed to the hot cut area. Thank you. Dr. Larichelle, can I talk to you about a stroke alert? So 37-year-old female, last known well, 1430, expression of aphasia, right-sided facial weakness and weakness. Uh, pressure's okay. Sugar's okay. Uh, stroke alert? Yeah. Okay. I'll meet you over there. Deb, can we do a stroke activation, please, on a 37-year-old female? And we'll go to the hot cut area. And can I have a packet? Broadcast ED all zones. Broadcasting to ED all zones. Stroke alert to hot cut area. Five minute ETA. All right, ladies, we have a stroke alert, 37-year-old female. Uh, last known well was 1430, expression of aphasia, change in balance, altered mental status, right-sided weakness with a facial droop, heart rate's 102, 160 over 82, 100% on room air, and blood sugar's 109. All right, perfect. All right. Over here, please. Head first. Head first. Yes, please. Dr. Larchelle will be right here. Good. Uh, a little bit more. And our colour specialist will be up on the monitor very shortly. Hey Doc, how are you? Good morning. You guys ready for a story? Hi there, I'm Dr. Larchell. This is Erica Sparkles. She's 37 years of age. She's coming from a family party. They had a sudden onset of uh, altered mental status, confusion, some expressive aphasia, and uh, unsteady balance when walking. You guys ready? Yeah. One, two, three. She's got no prior history of stroke. She does have a history of aortic stenosis, no medications, no allergies. She's not on any anti-coags that we know of. Uh, she's got a blood sugar of 109, blood sugar 160 over 80s, heart rate 100s, uh, two IVs. Last known well time was approximately 2.30, so like 30, 40 minutes ago, maybe. Okay. Um, what else can I tell you? Definite right-sided deficit. She's got like little piece of grip strength on the right side. Really can't put her words together. We did notice a little bit of her facial group, but I can't really say for sure if that was it. But the right side is just like basic. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Erica. I'm Dr. Larchelle. I'm one of the emergency department physicians. Um, this is Dr. Cordy who just came on. He's one of our teleneurologists, okay? From what the paramedics were telling us, you had some sudden weakness to your right arm and right leg, and then difficulty speaking. Does that sound right? Yeah, I know you're having trouble talking, so you can nod in response to. Dr. Cordy's gonna ask you to do a couple things, and then we're probably gonna move you very quickly to CAT scan. Does that sound okay with you? Okay, I'm gonna move him a little closer to talk to you, okay? Doc Dr. Cordy, this is Erica. Uh, for, for EMS, she had sudden onset at 2.30 of right-sided weakness, including the right arm and leg, as well as facial droop. And she was also aphasic as of that time. And her symptoms have persisted in route here. Her blood sugar was 140 in route here. Um, and she has uh, ongoing symptoms now. Okay, sounds good. All right, labs have been drawn. She's on the monitor, I'll call CAT scan. Okay. Hey, are you ready for the stroke alert I have in my pit stop? Yep, first time head first, please. Awesome, thank you.
the CAT scan does not show a bleed, we can proceed to taking the patient to the nook for the further assessment. Perfect. Perfect. And our creatinine is 0.8. Hello, ma'am. My name is Dr. Corti. I'm from Neurology. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So, so from what I've heard, you have some right arm and leg weakness and some trouble speaking. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, have you had any bleeding recently? Do you take any blood thinner medications? Have you had any surgeries in the past three months? And ha have you had a stroke in the past? Any headache or chest pain today? Okay. And uh, do we know when, when this all these symptoms started? Yeah. yeah. About two thirty. About two thirty. Last time I was about two thirty. All right. So let's premix TPA and get it to bedside. All right. Let me call the charge nurse. Call Valerie Moss. Okay. Oh, hello, Val. We're a TPA candidate. If you could start mixing, please. Okay, and can we just have a Yep, she is 70 kilos. Thank you. Thank you. You'll proceed to room 20 uh, when you come back. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, Val's pre mixing. So let's proceed with the stroke scale. Okay. okay. All right, ma'am, can you tell me what month it is right now? Yeah. What month is it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, how old are you? Yeah. Yeah. How old are you? Yeah. Okay. Can you blink your eyes? Okay. Can you squeeze her hand? Okay. Very good. Can you open your eyes big and look left and right? All right. Good. Uh, can you pull down your mask and show me a big smile? All right. Very good. Can you raise your eyebrows up? All right. Can you put your arms up straight ahead like you're holding a plate? for 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, good, you can put it down. Can you lift your left leg off the bed for five seconds? One, two, three, four, five, good. Can you lift your right leg at all? Okay. Hi, can you come and uh, double check TPA, please? Sure. Thank you. So I did the first round. 70 kilos is the weight. Here's your, and this is mixing. And it takes a little bit, and then I'm going to gently swirl. Like you're scratching an itch? Okay, good. Can you take the... Take the finger of your left hand and touch your nose. And now touch your finger and go back and forth. Okay, good. Can we check her sensation? Face, arms, and legs? Yep. Are you able to feel this here and on this side? Does it feel the same? All right. Left side, arm, right side. Does it feel the same? All right. And then your leg. And it feels the same? Okay. Okay. Can I check her visual fields? Yep. All right. I'm just going to wiggle my finger and just tell me if you can see it. All right. Other side. All right. Perfect. All right. Good. Are you able to tell me what's in this picture? Oh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me what this is? Oh, yeah. Okay, she's yeah. unable to name. 
can you read this line for me? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And can you say any of these words for me? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. So stroke scale is complete. All right, perfect. You want to get her in for our CTA? Uh, yes, she uses she uses CTA after we begin the TPA drip. All right, perfect. So let's bring her to room twenty, and we'll get the TPA started. Next, the total volume is fifty six point seven. The tubing holds twenty six mLs. We want to uh, minus the twenty six mLs from the total volume, so we'll set it at forty. Okay, ma'am. So they call me in because they wanted to know: is this a stroke, and is there anything to do about it right now? So at this point in time, it seems like you may be having a stroke, and since you came in quickly, you're eligible for a medication called TPA. TPA is a strong blood thinning medication. If this is a stroke, it gives a 33% chance of improvement, but a 3 to 6% chance of worsening. Within that 3 to 6% chance, you may have infection, bleeding, bleeding in the brain, or in very rare cases, death but it's far more likely to help you than it is to harm you. If you do not want this medication, we'll give you aspirin, and hopefully it gets better on its own, but I cannot guarantee that. At this point, would you like this medication? Okay. So we're proceeding with Alta, please. Perfect. Can we do a timeout? Yes, let's do the timeout. So this patient, uh, she weighs 70 kilograms. Her her total dose will be 63, her bolus will be 6.3, her infusion will be 56.7, and her discard will be 37. Correct. Alright, and we've checked her blood pressure, it is normal, so we can proceed with the bolus. Starting the bolus now. Okay, bolus time has been recorded. All right, bolus is complete. Starting the drip at fifty-six point seven. So that's a, a neat video about our stroke process in the emergency department, and we're hoping to uh, show that to the community to, and also to serve as an education uh, to our staff in the emergency department on our uh, uh, process for acute stroke. Um, during the video, you saw that our neurologist uh, often will do a very brief stroke scale on arrival to look at gross symptoms that the patient is having. But the neurologist, uh, in conjunction with the neurologist, we perform a stroke scale. And this is called the NIH uh, stroke scale. This is used nationally in, in, in emergency departments to evaluate uh, neurologic dysfunction uh, on arrival. And then we can trend the patient with this scale to see how they, if they've made improvements or if they've had a change in status uh, as well. You can see this scale includes things such as motor movement in the arm or legs, uh, visual field changes, the ability to, or cognitive function, uh, limb uh, ataxia, so discoordination in the limb, sensory change. <coughs> the scale is not perfect, so you can imagine the example I use is if someone is a, a piano player and they have a, a stroke that impacts their right hand, um, they, will ha uh, they will have a very low stroke scale. So we might be less likely to consider um, a, an acute therapy for them unless we know the background to say that, that the, hand, the dysfunction they're going to have in their hand potentially long term um, would be a, a significant disability to them based on, their, uh, based on their circumstance. So the scale is not perfect, but it gives us an idea of how things are changing for the patient over time and grossly what is their dysfunction on arrival but we also consider things more closely as to what is the actual dysfunction for the patient uh, in, in their life. This is a picture of an app that we also use to, uh, on our phones to record the stroke scale quickly. So in, uh, one of the things we mentioned in the American Heart Association initiative is rapidly obtaining imaging of the brain. And this is a, a, a brief diagram that shows um, a, a, a fl workflow for obtaining brain imaging after the patient arrives. And really our focus is initially on obtaining a CAT scan of the head to look for a bleed. And so that's our 15% of patients that present with stroke that have a bleed. 85% uh, of patients, though, will have a, a normal CAT scan. 
uh, on arrival. So this is a patient experiencing a very large stroke in the middle cerebral artery territory on the left side. When they arrive, we do a CAT scan, and their CAT scan looks normal. Um, and this patient's having an ischemic stroke, and in a very significant one. This CAT scan obtained a couple of days later, you can see that there's a, a hypodensity in this area of the brain, where that area of the brain has been uh, impacted significantly from the stroke. Not something we see initially, so the CAT scan doesn't tell us are they having a stroke or not. It tells us uh, is there any bleeding or not. We can see changes on that CAT scan uh, several days later. A couple more pictures. So this is similar to the prior side, an ischemic stroke, where you can see the hypodensity or, or on this side of the brain. And so that uh, area of the brain has been impacted significantly from a stroke and the swelling associated with that stroke. And then a hemorrhagic stroke, so that 15%, with a uh, large area of bleed and the uh, blood shows up white on the brain on CAT scan, and that's what we're looking for uh, initially. In the video you saw uh, Val, one of our uh, ED nurses, uh, mix in a medication called TPA. So this is one of our acute stroke therapies. Um, in the body, there's a constantly a balance between uh, cl uh, clotting and degradation of clot. And so we're constantly forming small clots and degrading those clots. Some people are at increased risk for clot formation in the body. Um, and that is because of an imbalance in, 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 uh, in that process. TPA, so tissue plasminogen activator, is a, is a drug that we've used for a very long time in, in acute stroke. Um, and TPA catalyzes the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin, so it, it essentially increases uh, clot breakdown. So our goal is to break down clot that may have formed to cause a stroke and prevent uh, further damage to that tissue surrounding that core area, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So this is a map of all the stroke trials that we've seen uh, since 1990. So TPA, uh, the first TPA trial was in 1995. Um, the FDA approved a TPA for use in 1996. Uh, those studies showed improved clinical outcomes at three months. And when we, as we were talking about, our goal in stroke therapy is to mitigate disability in, uh, in long term. And we, what we do is we look at how our patients uh, perform in at three months. Are they able to return to their regular, to their baseline activities? Um, and we use a scale consist, fairly consistently across the studies uh, to measure that. There was no change in mortality um, over that three month period. Um, we needed to treat seven patients in order to receive a benefit. But there was an increase in intracranial hemorrhage. So when we, when we administer that clot busting medication, there is a, it does increase our risk of bleeding because we're reducing the ability, we're breaking down clot, we're also reducing the ability to, uh, to form clot in areas where we need to, um, to reduce bleeding. So there was a six, uh, the rate cited there was a 6% risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Now there are certain things that make a patient uh, uh, more at risk to have bleeding due to uh, TPA, um, so there are contraindications and, and relative contraindications that we consider um, uh, in each patient. A second trial, or more trials looked at expanding the time interval for treatment out to four and a half hours, and we were able to find that there is a subpopulation um, which may benefit from TPA uh, for a longer, uh, up, up to four and a half hours and not just up to three hours after onset of symptoms. So when we're talking to family, when we're talking to our uh, EMS teams, the, one of the important things we want to know is where, when did the symptoms start uh, so we can determine is the patient in that time window um, in order to receive uh, TPA. So this is the scale that we uh, talk about when we look at function at uh, three months. Um, and really we're looking at uh, zero, one, and two. So no symptoms, uh, no significant disability. So patient, despite some symptoms, are, they're able to c perform their daily activities and then slight disability. So they're, they're doing p pretty well, but they have a slight disability. Um, so we're really looking at the zero, one, uh, one to two um, levels when we're uh, judging uh, good function at three months. So this is a list, uh, it's a lot of small print here. This is a list uh, of contraindications to TPA. So these are things that we go over with the patient prior to administering TPA. So you have to be 18 years of age with an acute onset of stroke symptoms. We, um, you can't have a, a bleed in the brain. Um, no recent ischemic stroke, which might mean that there's an area of increased risk uh, of bleeding if we administer TPA. And then there's a lot of other uh, factors, um, such as uh, recent surgery. Um, there are, are additional exclusion criteria for three to four and a half hours.
And then we have some relative exclusion criteria. So these are things that we think about with the patient and when we have our risk discussion uh, with the patient before administering TPA, uh, these are things we talk about uh, that may put the patient at increased risk of bleeding from TPA. So we, we mentioned this, the concept of time is brain. So um, with each minute, there are a certain number of neuro we, we've understood there are a certain number of neurons that, uh, that uh, die. Um, however, with advancements in neuroimaging and perfusion-based imaging, uh, I think we can better understand uh, what tissue is at risk in the brain. Um, and I think in the future, the decision to administer TPA will be more based on the individual presentation and what we see on images rather than just the time interval. So this is a, probably the most important concept uh, in this lecture, and that is the idea of the ischemic, ischemic penumbra. Um, this is really what we're targeting in, in acute stroke therapy. So there's a core area in the brain that is significantly impacted by the stroke, and that tissue dies fairly quickly without oxygen and glucose. But there's also an area around that called the penumbra, and that is that the tissue area around the core that is at risk. So it's often ischemic, meaning it's not getting enough blood flow, and it could, and it, over time, that tissue will be impacted if we don't restore blood flow. So it's an air, penumbra is an area of reversible ischemia around the core area where there's an infarction or, or tissue death in that core area, um, often salvageable in the first few hours of, of uh, the acute stroke. So you can see on the left-hand uh, uh, left side here, this is a patient experiencing a stroke with a small core area and a large area of salvageable tissue. So this patient may, if we, are, if we think about in the future driving uh, our decision for therapy, they have a lot of at-risk tissue. So this tissue is likely impacted long-term. This is a large area of at-risk tissue. So we may consider, be more likely to consider an acute stroke therapy for that patient. And also this depends on their collateral blood flow. So the, if they have good collateral blood flow from the other areas of brain, then they might uh, have more of uh, salvageable tissue in that area. In this case, um, the core is quite large. So there's a, there's a large impacted area, there's a small area of salvageable tissue. So you can imagine the risk of administering a, a medication like TPA, may, it may be more risky to do that than the benefit from uh, saving a small area of tissue that is at risk. And TPA really helps to reperfuse that ischemic penumbra. So we're trying to salvage the penumbra we're not really trying to salvage that core. This is an example of uh, some of the imaging we can perform. Um, this is typically performed here uh, inside the hospital. Um, this is a CT scan in a patient experiencing a large middle cerebral artery stroke. So similar to the images uh, we looked before, we're initially looking for bleeding in the brain. On the right hand side, you'll see a diffusion weighted image. So this is an MRI image. Um, diffusion weighted image shows high intensity signal within minutes of a stroke. So if we're able to get someone into an MRI machine within minutes of a stroke, we may see these changes. And that, confer that really that serves to confirm that the patient is having a stroke. This results from uh, edema or tissue swelling in that area, and there's decrease in water diffusion into that area of the stroke. Top row here, this is our non-contrast, so uh, our quick image we get when patients arrive. This shows that there, it's a normal study, so there's, we suspect there's an ischemic stroke, a blockage in a blood vessel. This image uh, is an initial perfusion image that shows that there's a core area impacted. And then the second image shows this is the ischemic penumbra, a potential area that could be impacted, and so that's the potential salvageable area. So there is, uh, this is mostly performed at academic medical centers, um, larger uh, comprehensive stroke centers uh, where they're doing endovascular therapy. This diagram, we do, this is a CTA, and we do perform this uh, in our emergency department. Um, and this shows that there's a cutoff in the middle cerebral artery on the left side. So that correlates to our picture here where there's a, 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 an acute stroke involving the left uh, middle cerebral artery. So in, in our emergency department, if we obtain this image and we see a, an occlusion in a larger vessel here, that's when we consider other therapies such as endovascular therapy or mechanical thrombectomy, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is an MRI image similar to our CT scan, our diffusion weighted image. So it shows the dif uh, diffusion into that area of the brain, which we showed a minute ago. And then this is our perfusion image here. 
And when we see a large mismatch between these two images, that tells us that we have a core area impacted, and then we have an area of brain that might be salvageable. So that is our uh, penumbra. And again, we see an acute occlusion of the middle cerebral artery here. So sometimes when we uh, bring patients from, they might be in our emergency department, we do a non-contrast image, we do an angio, angio image that shows a cutoff in the blood vessel. Then we make a phone call and talk with our neuroendovascular surgeon. And when they arrive, say in Boston, um, they would obtain either a CT perfusion, but more likely an MRI to say, what, at this time, what is our uh, at-risk tissue that we could salvage? So we also, um, there have been studies over the last 10 years that have asked the question, does TPA improve functional outcome compared with placebo in patients with ischemic stroke four and a half to nine hours? So beyond that four and a half hour period, after onset of wake up, uh, wake up uh, after onset or wake up strokes in patients undergoing CT perfusion or perfusion diffusion MRI. So the question is, can we obtain imaging that shows there is at risk tissue after four and a half hours, our typical cutoff for TPA, where those patients might benefit from uh, TPA. And the other stroke that, we, that uh, is really challenging for us is when a patient wakes up with a stroke. So they, if they go to bed normal at 10 o'clock at night, but at 5 a.m. they come to us because they got up to go to the bathroom and they had difficulty walking. So we don't know did that a stroke occur at 11 o'clock or did it occur at 4 a.m. And so we're trying to figure out is, are the, are, is there a, uh, a population of patients who wake up with a stroke where we don't know the exact uh, onset who might be a candidate for TPA or other therapy. And a lot of times that is going to be, and really that is going to be driven by what our imaging shows and if we can demonstrate there is uh, still some salvageable tissue. So this is an example of uh, an MRI. Um, so on the right hand side, there's a lot of the diffusion weighted image shows us, yes, the patient is having a stroke. The flare image, so the DWI changes are very quick, so within minutes of the stroke. And then we do a flare series, so the second image you can see there, where uh, though the signal changes there tend to be delayed. So those are often hours after a stroke. Um, the flare is related to vaso vasogenic edema that occurs, and that can take a couple hours to, to, um, to develop. So on this picture, this patient uh, has a DWI image saying, yes, we have a stroke, but there's not a lot of change on the flare image. And the same on this side, too, the second example. DWI change, but not a lot of flare change. So if the flare takes a couple hours to develop, we know this stroke might be acute. So if someone comes to us at 5 a.m., this might demonstrate that the stroke occurred within the last uh, two hours, and uh, they have an area, it could have an area of that rest tissue we could save. So there's a mismatch between those two pictures. Here we see a similarity. So there's a diffusion change here, a flare change here, a diffusion change here, a flare change here. And so there's a match between what we see in those two images, which may demonstrate that the, because the flare takes several hours to develop, that this stroke may have occurred uh, many hours ago. And that patient may be, uh, there may be less uh, uh, tissue that we can save so that ischemic penumbra is smaller. So there have been several studies um, really looking at imaging findings and whether patients can uh, receive TPA beyond four and a half hours. Most of those studies have been underpowered and have been stopped uh, early. And so we, we don't have good data right now to, um, uh, to administer TPA in that four and a half to nine hour period. But we, may, we have another uh, option for therapy that we're going to talk about next. This is an example of another drug similar to TPA that, that I think will come to the market at some point in the future. So this is a genetically engineered variant of TPA called tenecteplase. It has a longer half-life than TPA. It's given as a single IV bolus. So right now we have to give a, a, an initial injection over 10 minutes, and then we have to give a, 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 the rest of the medication over that hour. Um, so this is a single IV dose. It has a high fibrin specificity. And studies show a trend toward functional, uh, improvement, improved functional outcomes at three months, um, but not significant at this time. So our studies right now with this uh, medication are looking at can we give this drug safely prior to if we perform a mechanical thrombectomy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we do give TPA prior to doing that now. Is there a population of patients with a low stro uh, stroke scale on arrival that might be a candidate for this medication, whereas we're less likely to give that with uh, TPA? 
it's not currently FDA approved, but I think in the next several years we may see uh, this uh, 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 drug enter our uh, workflow. So beyond TPA, so the challenges we see with TPA, um, it has been the cornerstone of uh, acute stroke treatment over the last 25 years. The problem is it has a narrow ther therapeutic window. So we have a narrow time period right now where we can administer TPA. If we want to admit, if in the future, I think even if we want to administer beyond the four and a half hours, uh, there are limitations to what we can obtain in imaging acutely. There are contraindications. So only 8% of acute stroke patients are eligible for TPA. Um, there is a risk of bleeding that's not insignificant. And the TPA is not really effective um, in recannulizing large vessel occlusions. So when we have a large clot, when we have a large clot in a large vessel, TPA is not really effective in uh, reducing that clot burden. So as, as I said, there's when large thrombi are less responsive to that enzymatic digestion, when we're talking about large vessel occlusions, we're talking about uh, occlusions in the uh, intracranial uh, uh, internal carotid artery. The, particularly the middle cerebral artery, uh, the basilar artery. And those, uh, when we have occlusion in those arteries, uh, the, the infarct size or, air, or that core tends to be larger. Patients have more significant deficits, so more disability when they present to us. And then they actually have higher disability and mortality uh, at three months. Mortality rate for uh, some of our large vessel occlusions. So an occlusion in the basilar artery um, in the posterior circulation has a mortality rate of 90%. In the internal carotid artery, the mortality rate is 50%, and in the middle cerebral artery, the mortality rate is 25%. So the mortality rate is very high when we have an occlusion in one of those large vessels, and further, the disability rate at three months is very high as well. So wh what can we do for these patients? We know TPA is not particularly effective. So a lot of the studies in the last uh, 10 years have surrounded uh, mechanical thrombectomy. And over the time, um, and these did start bef uh, back uh, between 2000 and 2010, uh, the technology has also evolved over this time period, so our, our studies are looking at uh, different technology now. This is an ex uh, so we're going to talk about mechanical uh, thrombectomy, and this is a device called a stent retriever that uh, a neuroendovascular surgeon would use to remove a clot. And the device, uh, the uh, stent is extended beyond the clot, um, the stent is then uh, deployed, it's able to wrap around the clot, we deploy a balloon behind it and then pull the clot out. This is a pre-procedure example of the stent, post-procedure, this is a, a clot that's been removed. It doesn't look that big, but this is a, a very large clot uh, removed from a, from a fairly small artery. You can see this is an even bigger clot uh, that's been removed from uh, one of the larger arteries. So I'm going to show some uh, pictures here. So this would be an example of what uh, a process for a patient with a large vessel occlusion um, if they present to our emergency department. So we would do our non-contrast study. So this is us in the, in the red box, a non-contrast head CT that says we don't see a bleed in the brain. So now we're in that ischemic component. So we're asking the question, where could that uh, blockage in the blood vessel be? We administer dye through an IV to look at the blood vessels in the brain, and we see there's an occlusion in the uh, right middle cerebral artery. We then contact our, uh, our uh, comprehensive stroke center, um, we, and the patient flies there. On arrival, they may do a quick MRI to say, what is the, is confirmed there's a stroke there with diffusion weighted image, and then do a, uh, other images to say, is there, an, is, that, is there a large area of ischemic penumbra, so at-risk tissue? They'll go to the angiography suite with a neurosurgeon who will inject dye, and you can see there's a lack of blood flow to this area of the brain, so there's a lack of fill-in of uh, of, to the blood vessels in that area. So we have an occlusion right here in the middle cerebral artery, and then we deploy the stent, pull the clot out, and we've restored blood flow here. And it's people, And then this is our MRI, actually, 24 hours later, and we can see that we have the similar picture here, here. So this is pre-procedure, post-procedure. There's a similar diffusion deficit on both of those pictures. Um, so the area of brain has uh, impacted has not changed. And the important thing about this is on this image, there was a, an area of ischemic penumbra, so at-risk tissue likely, that has not expanded. So our core is the same before and after. And so we've probably salvaged that tissue around that uh, core area that was at risk. And sometimes um, people have dr dr uh, drastic improvement in symptoms. 
So uh, we're talking about a patient who may present to us with uh, inability to talk, uh, and they may, with retrieval of the clot, begin talking suddenly on the uh, table in the operating room um, at the comprehensive strokes. This is an another example of a patient with a left uh, middle cerebral artery stroke. So we can see a cutoff on our angio study here. And then this is our MRI showing uh, an acute stroke in that area of the brain. And this patient, again, had, we can see a lack of blood flow to this area of the brain here with an occlusion of this blood vessel. And after removal of the clot, we have restored blood flow to that area of the brain. So it's pretty drastic. And you can see there's a very large area of the brain that was impacted that uh, we've restored blood flow to. So not something that we see a lot of uh, impact from TPA to digest that large clot, but when we go in and remove the clot, we can restore good blood flow to that area. All right. So we've had two decades of uh, research on mechanical thrombectomy, uh, beginning in 1999. Um, there have been 12 randomized controlled trials, and eight of the last nine have shown positive results. And really the landmark trial was the Mr. Clean trial in 2015 that showed improved clinical outcomes uh, with a number needed to treat to impact the patient outcome of seven. And other studies have showed a number needed to treat as even lower, you know, four patients, five patients. Um, so the impact of this therapy can be pretty significant. There's a lot, not a lot of therapies that, in medicine that have a number needed to treat or a number of patients that we need to uh, treat in order to experience a significant improvement in outcome. So this has largely changed acute uh, stroke treatment in the last uh, five years, and I think we'll see an evolution of this as we figure out what additional patient populations are candidates uh, for mechanical thrombectomy in the future. This is a, a quick chart showing that over, uh, since the Mr. Clean trial in 2015, we've seen a disability improvement in patients who underwent mechanical thrombectomy in eight out of nine of the last, uh, eight of the last nine trials. Um, and the DAWN trial, particularly in 2017, showed uh, a benefit out to 24 hours. So right now we consider therapy a mechan for, with mechanical thrombectomy out to 24 hours. Mechanical thrombectomy effective for large anterior circulation strokes, uh, particularly. Uh, so when there's a large area of the brain impacted when, and when there's a large salvageable penumbra. So when there's a large area of at-risk tissue that we can save. I think the future uh, for mechanical thrombectomy, we'll look at is it safe to perform mechanical thrombectomy alone uh, in patients in the window for IV TPA? So could we get a patient quickly uh, to an angiography suite to undergo a mechanical thrombectomy within the first couple hours and avoid a given TPA? So in those large vessel strokes where we know TPA may not be significantly impactful, can we avoid the risks of TPA and get them right to a mechanical thrombectomy? And I think there's a need to confirm benefit out to 24 hours. So we saw the DAWN trial uh, showed us that, but there's a need for further studies to show us that as well. So we talk a little bit about kind of a stroke program and how we think about uh, stroke overall. So there's a care continuum we think about. So uh, this starts in the community. So there's education surrounding those modifiable risk factors for stroke. So that's our, and that includes our visit to our primary care doctors where we're working on those risk factors education to the community to recognize stroke symptoms. So when we're talking about that BFAST scale, particularly also recognizing those symptoms of stroke in the back of the brain. Uh, education to our EMS services, uh, so state protocols, local protocols, um, uh, and working with those teams. Uh, the things that we do in the emergency department for acute stroke, transition in that care to the inpatient uh, side, and then how do we coordinate uh, transition of care back to uh, primary care physician's office? Because a lot of times we may change medications or make adjustments or patients may require rehabilitation after uh, their inpatient stay. So we use a lot of data when we're looking at, so particularly acute stroke, we use data when we look at <clears throat> how quickly we are able to get patients uh, uh, to image in uh, and to consider some of the ac acute stroke treatments what percentage of patients end up on uh, the uh, needed medications when they leave the hospital. And then that data drives our improvement initiatives and then we work to sustain those improvements. So we are a primary stroke center, so we have stroke dedicated uh, floors. We have a, a stroke program manager. Um, the one thing we don't do here is a mechanical thrombectomy and we have uh, partnerships with uh, academic centers that do perform uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Um, so we really do comprehensive stroke here, care here minus uh, some of those neuro uh, endovascular functions. And then we don't provide a full spectrum of hemorrhagic stroke care when it relates to aneurysms. Uh, those are typically done at uh, larger academic centers as well. 
so these are the two hospitals we uh, have a main partnership with, Massachusetts General Hospital. So Dr. Leslie Maz, we, we work with uh, very closely with their uh, neuroendovascular program. And then uh, Dr. Chris Ogilvie, uh, who's a neuroendovascular surgeon at uh, Beth Israel in Boston. And so our patients typically, if they have a large vessel occlusion or they need aneurysm care, will fly to Boston uh, from our emergency department. We also began a partnership uh, with uh, a telestroke uh, group called Telespecialists uh, back in October. And I'll show you a little bit more about what we're able to do with this group. You saw them come on the screen um, very quickly uh, when our patient, or in our video when the patient arrived. Um, so they're on screen within, on average, four minutes to, t to talk with us. If the patient presents by EMS, they're often on the screen waiting for the patient to arrive. And so they collaborate with us uh, as soon as the patient arrives to make decisions regarding uh, imaging and acute therapy. And we, and we work with them. They've really changed our quality management system for stroke. So each month we meet with them and we look at uh, a lot of metrics. So for example, how long does it take us to connect with them? Uh, uh, are we able to identify stroke? Uh, outside of the hospital, in the ambulance, are we able to identify patients experiencing stroke symptoms in the waiting room, in triage when they present? Um, how long does it take us to administer TPA? And anytime there's a fallout, we do a root cause analysis and we look back at the case to figure out where there might have been an opportunity to improvement. If we see trends, then uh, we make uh, process changes uh, that are data informed. And then we reevaluate from there. So this has really changed our ability to look at the stroke process. And it has been impactful for us. Uh, this is a, a chart showing um, door to uh, treatment times. So when a patient arrives to us, how long does it take for us to administer uh, TPA? Uh, about a year ago, we were uh, on average about 70 minutes. And now we've reduced that time to around 30 minutes now. And I really think that partnership with telespecialists, our collaboration there has been really impactful to reduce some of these times and improve uh, stroke care. So we're fortunate uh, to have that partnership with them. Each month we look at, we have a list of best practices that we work on with uh, telespecialists. And in this last six months, we have met all of those best practices, except for one, which is our next project, and that's to administer uh, TPA uh, in actually right outside of our CAT scan machine um, with the neurologist there. We, uh, we look at metric, we have quarterly metrics, we look at uh, quarterly goals, uh, and we have some PI uh, process improvement focuses as well. So a really neat system to improve stroke care. So I'll touch briefly on inpatient stroke scale. We didn't talk a lot about this. Inside the hospital, when, we're, when we admit patients with a stroke, we're really doing an investigation. We're trying to figure out why did they have a stroke? Was it because of an arrhythmia that we're going to see on, a, on our, our cardiac telemetry monitor? Um, we do an echocardiogram. Is there a, a place in the heart where a, a clot is forming that may travel to the brain? Um, we might put them on a, a monitor as they exit the hospital to look for a heart arrhythmia. There are certain thing, medications that we consider when they're in the hospital to start that may prevent a second stroke. Uh, some medications we leave them on for about three weeks. Um, we employ our uh, uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy team to work with our stroke patients. We have diabetes and nutrition and educators. So there's a lot of things, uh, smoking cessation as well. There's a lot of things we do inside the hospital uh, it, it, to figure out why did the stroke occur and then how can we prevent another stroke. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Chodosh, one of our electrophysiologists. He's a, a cardiologist uh, in Concord. And he was one of the uh, first cardiologists in New England to uh, begin uh, using, uh, doing the, uh, or implanting the Watchman device. And this is for patients with atrial fibrillation, who we know are at risk for uh, clot formation in the heart because of the arrhythmia. There's a particular area in the left atrium of the heart. Uh, so the little outpouching, which may be at, which we know in atrial fibrillation, you're at risk to form a clot there. The Watchman uh, device is placed in that appendage to close, up, to close it off from the, left of the, left, uh, from the rest of the left atrium and hopefully prevent uh, clot formation in the setting of atrial fibrillation. So there are some patients, and, and what we worry about most in atrial fibrillation is a risk for uh, stroke. And there are some patients we're able to keep off of blood thinning medication after performing this procedure, which as you can imagine is a significant, uh, has a significant impact on uh, quality of life. So I'm going to show you a, a stroke rehabilitation video that uh, was put together by um, our physical therapy and rehab department, Carrie Scribner, uh, who you'll see as the first person on the video, and show some of the tools we use uh, with stroke patients uh, inside of the hospital. 
Hi, welcome to Inpatient Rehab at Concord Hospital. My name is Carrie Scribner. I'm an occupational therapist and the director of our department. Love to have you come in and take a look around our state-of-the-art gym and show you some of the tools that we have to use with our patients to help them regain independent function. We're extremely fortunate in an acute care hospital to have access to a gym of this size and magnitude. We have many pieces of equipment that would be featured at a rehab hospital which gives us the opportunity not only to work with our patients at the bedside and on the nursing units, but for the appropriate patients, bring them to a gym setting. We also would utilize this setting for folks that maybe are here a little longer than anticipated due to financial or psychosocial reasons that can't be discharged from the hospital. I'm gonna take an opportunity to have a few of my colleagues walk through the equipment that we have. Hi, I'm Kim, I'm one of the physical therapists, and just to share with you some of the capabilities we have. One of the first things, we have this uh, cart for vestibular rehab for assisting our providers in identifying posterior type circulation strokes where we rule in versus um, central versus peripheral causes of vertigo, kind of help give them an idea if there's some abnormal eye movements that they're not seeing that we can, that suggest some opportunities for further testing. Um, we also use it in treatment as well. Additionally, for patients who have significant motor impairments, we have this Moveo table, which is a very early mobilization platform for patients. It's basically a modified tilt table, and it allows us to do single limb training while modifying and um, titrating, essentially, level of weight bearing so that patients who have low motor function can start to weight bear in a very safe manner. It allows them to rest as needed so that if fatigue kicks in, Nobody has to worry about um, loss of balance or falling. It allows us to simulate um, up to 80% weight bearing and we can do um, different styles where we load both limbs together or we load one limb at a time, um, basically doing modified leg presses to progress for bed mobility and transfers. Um, another really unique device we have is this harness system. We have a nice 20-foot track in the center of the gym. We also have one over our electronic parallel bars um, where we can do a single touch to address um, widths, multiple widths and heights of the parallel bars for gait training and single um, limb loading. We can do a lot um, to support balance while engaging limb advancement. Um, so this really gives us a means to stabilize a patient, especially some who have that really odd presentation of lateral medullary syndrome where they're getting thrown to one side or another. Um, we also have a very safe application to our stairs where we have two different types of hand grips um, we can use. We have the opportunity to do um, for patients who have higher functioning um, limbs where we can do kind of supported, coordinated bilateral leg and arm involvement to engage in strength and cardiorespiratory conditioning. One other device to support early mobility with our stroke population, um, we have this uh, Sarah Plus sit-to-stand walking device um, that has a special spade seat that we can drive up to the patient. We can lock this and basically we can use this to support let them get to the edge and sit and we've got this securement device uh, and we can use this to lift the system into standing. They can weight bear through their forearms if they don't have good upper extremity motor control and then we can use this to guide and support initiating steps while being fully supported. As you probably know, occupational therapy's job is to focus on returning patients to their independent function at what are called activities of daily living. A lot of time in the acute care environment such as this, we would do things within their room, uh, maybe on the nursing unit. However, for patients that are higher level, we do have an opportunity to engage them in things that they would need to practice for home. So we have a full kitchen, um, this, you know, fully working, we can practice reaching, manipulating, look at their balance, look at their cognition, um, the ability to prepare a simple snack or a simple meal. Um, one of the cognitive tests that we use actually has people go through and prepare a meal. So we actually have an induction cooker that we put here and have them prepare food. 
In addition to that, we utilize many standardized tests that look at folks' cognition after a stroke or other impairment. We can look at things such as executive function, the ability to follow commands, the ability to use basic speech language, um, which is obviously more assessed by our speech language pathologist. We can look at memory, and we can look at the ability to apply those skills to being able to take care of themselves and ideally going home um, unless they need to go to rehab. Also in this area, you'll see we have some pieces of adaptive equipment for bathrooms. So this is a few of the shower chairs. This is a larger shower bench, and a smaller shower chair. Uh, we utilize this piece of equipment so that patients, again, can be as independent as possible um, in their home environment, being able to shower themselves, which for most folks is part of their daily activities before they come into the hospital. We are able to practice that activity in our bathroom. This bathroom does not have any running water, which is nice, but it does have a full setup of safety bars. So in addition to the seats, we're able to demonstrate to patients where safety bars could be installed in their home and help them communicate that idea with VNA or maybe a family member, depending on who's going to be setting this up for them when they leave. We are also extremely fortunate that as an organization, we are given access to multiple pieces of adaptive equipment. What I'm going to show you now is we have equipment that we can give to patients, things like reachers, so that they can reach and pick things up easier, um, ways to put on socks, adaptive feeding equipment. Um, we have access to and the ability to give this equipment to our patients prior to them leaving um, so that they can utilize that either here at home or at the rehab facility. The last thing I wanted to show you up here is our car and we actually use this to practice with patients and their families the ability to get in and out of the car. We don't do driving assessments per se but again the ability to get in and out of the car to leave the hospital, go to doctor's appointments, um, be able to just engage in the environment that they live in is huge for people and this tends to be something that many patients are frightened of doing. Um, and families really don't know how to move them. So we can have family members come up here, we can practice it a few times um, in this environment before we have to do it for real out in the driveway. We're very fortunate to also have a splint cart. Um, we utilize a splint cart to make uh, largely hand splints. So if you envision the plastic splints that are, you see people walking around with on their hands, um, we can fabricate custom splints for people that have either hemiparesis or tone in the hand and help work on positioning them to normal as we work on rehabilitating the functional use of that extremity. Hi, my name is Lauren Kamara. I'm the speech language pathologist here at Concord Hospital. I'm going to be taking a few minutes to talk about some of the things that I do in the inpatient world uh, with our stroke population. Um, and then I can talk a little bit about some outpatient follow-up services we provide too. With our stroke population, I can provide a thorough swallowing assessment of any kind of potential needs and concerns that the patient is having. I oftentimes start assessing a patient at bedside, providing them different consistencies of liquids and solids to determine if the patient is having any potential risk for aspiration or having things go into their lungs. We can make modifications right at the bedside and I can follow them throughout their inpatient stay. If there's concern for additional swallowing impairments or some silent aspiration, we are able to actually bring our patients down often same day into the radiology suite, which I can highlight a little bit closer for you guys here. So we can bring all of our patients down to this suite. We usually have them aligned in this uh, fluoro tube right here. They're usually set up laterally with their shoulder against this wall. This is our actual x-ray tube. The radiologist or the PA is able to actually t help us take the images right here from the uh, mobile station. We have one of the 
screens that we are able to capture all of the images in in real time. And then this is our newer piece of equipment called the TIMS unit. We are also able to provide real-time images of what we are capturing under the x-ray. All right, so this is the last slide, just to recap. Um, so we're, I think in the future we're going to move from this time is brain uh, phenomenon where we're thinking about these intervals where patients are candidates to, for therapy to more perfusion-based um, uh, where we're looking at what area of the brain may be impacted if we administer an acute therapy. So we're looking at that ischemic penumbra. And I think decisions to administer TPA will be more based on that image and finding and more individualized to the patient. Um, so in the, our treatment in the future, again, we'll target that penumbra, that at-risk area. We may consider TPA beyond four and a half hours in a certain population of patients. We'll know more about how do we treat patients who wake up with a stroke in the morning, and we don't know when it occurred overnight. Particularly, can our imaging drive that therapy? Are there some patients who may go directly to uh, a center that can uh, perform a mechanical thrombectomy and we would not administer TPA knowing the risks? There are some risks with TPA. Um, and then are there patients that would be a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy who have more milder stroke symptoms um, so we may be able to expand the population of patients that can undergo that procedure? So pretty exciting stuff. A lot of this has happened, particularly with mechanical thrombectomy in the last five years. And I think with advancements in imaging and additional studies in the next five years, uh, I think our acute stroke care will change even more. And I think we're fortunate to have the relationships we have uh, as a primary stroke center where we perform most of our stroke care here, um, but also have that relationship with uh, larger centers that perform mechanical thrombectomy. Thank you everyone for joining today.